All rise. Uh, welcome uh, for our second case in the morning session. I know we've got a group of students from the Academy. Um, I guess that's the folks over here. So welcome. Uh, we will, at the end of this argument, we'll open it up for some questions from you all. You weren't here initially, so let me introduce myself. My name is Scott Maycar. I'm the presiding judge today. I'm from Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, to my right is Judge Harvey J, who also is from Jacksonville, Florida. The two of us were uh, transferred, essentially, uh, almost like a draft in the sports league. Uh, we were moved to the 5th District Court of Appeal based on the, out of Daytona Beach we were, uh, earlier this year. So we're new on the court. We were the 5th DCA, having come from Tallahassee. We were both serving on the 1st District Court of Appeal based in Tallahassee. And to my left is Judge Joe Boatwright, who many of you probably know. Uh, I think there may be someone out there that has a relationship there, a family member so, and so forth, um, who is uh, actually not the newest member um, by the stretch, but because we just had a new judge appointed this weekend, but um, like the rest of us is new to the 5th District and we're all learning together. And one of the great aspects of being an appellate court judge is we sit in three judge panels, sometimes 12, but typically three, and we have great colleagues, we have great collegiality with one another in deciding these cases. I don't get to decide this case. Jay doesn't, Judge Bober doesn't, the three of us have to get together and decide all the cases that come before us. So we'll have a little opportunity after this case, have some question and answer, and then um, I don't know if I talk with someone from the school, but we'll certainly make an opportunity if you want to come up and take a picture with the court and other folks that are here. We'll do that. So the next case we have is 22 345, uh, Salier versus Tower Hill Select Insurance Company. Uh, we have uh, 20 minutes per side. Um, and we've got the appellant's lawyer here, the lawyer representing the person who's appealing. Um, Margie Sally, is it Salier or Salier? I think it's Salier. Salier, okay. Great. So would you like to reserve any time for rebuttal? Yes, Your Honor, five minutes, please. Okay, very good. Please proceed. Good morning, Jeffrey Marks. On behalf of the appellant, Margie Salier, I reserve five minutes for rebuttal. This is an appeal um, from a final summary judgment entered in favor of the insurance company in a first party insurance dispute um, arising out of Hurricane Irma claims. And I'm sure the members of the panel have had more than their fair share of Hurricane Irma claims. And we've had a number of cases come out and the law related to insurance, insurance contracts, interpretation of insurance contracts, assignments of benefits have, have been substantial as a result of that one incident. Um, in this particular case, the Salyer's home was <coughs> damaged during Hurricane Irma, or after Hurricane or during Hurricane Irma, and she made a claim with her insurance company. She also signed what is called an insurance direct payment authorization form with Mason Dixon Contracting. Um, the purpose or intent of signing that was to allow them to handle, and this is a factual issue, work for her home as a result of the damage. And the reason why I say it's a factual issue so I'll get into more detail, is that it's her intent, and the only evidence in the record was that it was her intent that this was to be a roofing contract, not a general contracting contract. Um, so your argument would be she could assign benefits for the roof, she could also find an assi assign an assignment of benefits provision for the windows. They got you know, they could be very or, or, other, or other damages to her home, that's correct. And, and, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but the reason why I said this is an issue of fact is I just want to get this out there is, is two points I think directly one contract says roofing on it contract also says though that Mason Dixon will perform services for uh, emergency services mold remediation and construction construction services so as the case developed um, in summary judgment she filed an affidavit saying it was my understanding my intent only to have this be a roofing contract Mason Dixon after she signed this agreement, submitted an estimate to Tower, Tower Hill Insurance Company, her insurance company, for several hundred thousand dollars, far exceeding a roofing repair, roof repairs. Are there any other contracts other than this assignment of benefit to show that this would be a roofing contract versus a total remodel? No, there are no, in, in the record, there are no other contracts. And 
that actually dovetails into the set. We've raised three issues on appeal. Let me, I, I want to go through this with you uh, yeah. in some detail. So what you're describing, as I hear it, is you're saying there is some written ambiguity in this agreement to, to get us into a situation where we would um, need to send it back for fact finding? That's one of the issues we've raised is that there's an ambiguity as to the scope of the agreement between her and Tower Hill. I, and I, I want to explore that as well. So uh, it would be your client's position in part that this agreement is ambiguous, correct? Correct, Your Honor, as to, as to that issue. Yeah. Well, and, and as I know you know, uh, there uh, are differences between patent uh, ambiguities and latent Correct. ambiguities. It, it would seem to this judge, I can't speak for the other two, as Judge Makar said, um, that any ambiguities here would be patent. So typically that would not allow us to send it back for fact finding. It would mean it would just be invalidated potentially. So uh, what do you think um, these ambiguities are? Are they patent or are they latent or are they intermediate? Well, I, I, it's interesting you say intermediate. It, it's, it's, and it's unusual for me to answer this question. I think it's hybrid and I'll tell you why I think it's a hybrid. I've got a contract on it in bold that says roofing on it. Um, I've got a reference to a roofing license GC number, license number, and a GC number in here as well. But I've got at the bottom, it says, Mason Dixon contractor will perform the following services, emergency services, mold remediation, construction services. This is all I have in, in this record. Um, part of the issue, but the second issue that we raise on the appeal is that the trial court did not continue we call it a stay, or the trial lawyers call it a stay, the summary judgment hearing because discovery was not complete. The plaintiff wanted to take depositions of Mason Dixon and Tower Hill, corporate representatives, one of whom filed an affidavit in this case, to explore the scope of the representation. But what I have is also an affidavit from the plaintiff, unrefuted by any other evidence, saying it was her intent that this was only to be a roofing contract. So, when, so to answer your question, it's hybrid because on the document, there are only two pieces of evidence I think that we cite to, which is um, the contract and her affidavit. And admittedly, there was the submission by Mason Dixon to the insurance company. And my understanding that, of the case is um, if it is an intermediate ambiguity, it would be something sent back for fact finding. If it's latent, it would be sent back for fact finding. Why would this not, though, be patent uh, from what you're describing, which potentially could invalidate this agreement? Well, uh, to the, my answer to the question is sure, I'd love it to be patent. I'd love the court to reverse and say this this contract um, is, cannot stand as a valid basis for to deny my client her right to sue the insurance company to obtain benefits under her insurance policy. That would be, that would be a, a, a grand slam type win for my client. But that's not necessarily the position that we took below, to answer your question, one. And two, um, we are here on summary judgment, and one of our arguments is that we weren't allowed to have a fully developed record. I, I understand that. As I understand our review, though, it's de novo. Correct. And, 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 that, and I think that one of the things that gets lost, and in this case had the unique procedural um, posture of the case was briefed for summary judgment, but the defendant moved for summary judgment, we had a rule change. Um, the plaintiff filed a motion to continue the summary judgment hearing to conduct the discovery. The judge said, no, what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna deny your motion to take additional discovery. And now, I know I'm mixing my arguments here, but they are kind of, they are kind of intertwined in, this, in, in my ability to answer this question. The trial judge said, I'm not gonna go forward on the summary judgment hearing under the old rule. Defendant, move, remove. Plaintiff, you have 20 days to respond. But there was pending before the court at that time a motion to continue or stay the summary judgment hearing to conduct two additional depositions, which the trial judge denied. Um, now, the defendant did file its amended motion for summary judgment, and the plaintiff did respond within the 20 days that was accorded by the court order. But those two depots were never taken because the court had entered an order saying, I'm not going to continue the summary judgment hearing. Now, the defendant castigates us for saying that we didn't raise the issue of stay, or he says it was, we used the word stay as opposed to continuance. To me, stay is the same thing as continuance for the parlance of ability to conduct all summary judgment 
um, discovery in advance of the summary judgment hearing. The uh, trial judge in this case uh, found this agreement was unambiguous. Correct. Correct. And so the, the predicate behind the trial judge's judgment, summary judgment, was there was no ambiguity here. Correct. It, and it, and his, and his analysis of ambiguity, though, was not based upon a, a determination of roofing versus general contracting. It was a determination of unambiguity on the interpretation of Sadiq and Brown, the two seminal cases, addressing when an assignment of benefits or an insurance direct payment authorization form can or cannot be enforced by a party. Is that not another ambiguity here where you have sentences saying, and, and I can read those, I know you know, of services rendered or to be rendered, and then you have services rendered, and then you have services rendered or to be rendered. So basically you have two and two in this agreement. Doesn't that create an ambiguity too? Well, it's interest, that's an interesting question because if I, if I answer your question by looking at Sadiq and Brown, they say that those agreements are unambiguous, okay? And then, but then they strikes me as almost ipsa dixit. But go ahead. But but they but they reverse the position of the homeowner, or in one case, the, the benefits provider, to allow the claim to proceed against the insurance company. So my answer is, I think that the language is is ambiguous because when you pick apart the Brown and Sadiq cases, which I think are controlling, and they're not directly on all fours factually, okay? Because in those cases, uh, the insurance company denied the coverage. And in our case, um, the insurance company disagreed with the scope of the estimate present, presented by Mason Dixon, but I go back to the fact that my client's position is they didn't have that authority. Coming around now to the to answer that question, I think that, the, the, that you pull out of Sadiq and Brown interpretation of this agreement where it talks about um, you know I'm assigning my rights and causes of action for services rendered or to be rendered for uh, agreement to perform labor services to performance under obligations under this contract or obtaining actual benefits to be paid by an insurance company when in this case you have an understanding in the agreement that the services are to be rendered or rendered and we have a fact pattern in this case that says that no services are rendered. It's undisputed in this record, notwithstanding the other lawsuit that's out there. Mason Dixon has its own lawsuit against the insurance company. But Mason Dixon hasn't done a lick of work on this woman's house, Hurricane Irma. Nothing in the record shows that they did anything, even with the eighty-six or eighty-nine thousand dollars that they received from the insurance company. Not even a roof. I mean, there's nothing in the record. And part of that is, I think, because we weren't able to depose the Tower Hill rep and the Mason Dixon rep to get an understanding of why. But the fact of the matter is that this woman signed an agreement with Mason Dixon to have them go to the insurance company and um, to provide work on her behalf. And she did not sign away, as she says in her affidavit, all of her rights to pursue against her insurance company. And she's left with nothing. So at this date, she has nothing from the insurance company and nothing from Mason Dixon. You mentioned then that she signed the Mason Dixon agreement. Uh, are we to construe this agreement against Mason Dixon? Um, well, I, I, the answer is you typically construe contracts against the drafter as a general principle of contract law. Um, and it, I don't believe I've read any case where the court analyzes that in an insurance direct payment authorization the courts say, you know, to deviate from the analysis of, of determining of whether you can shoot or against one or the other. But on this record, there are two things that I think that help me answer the question. First, my client says her understanding of this contract, and again, you know, parole evidence is allowed to come in when a contract is determined to be ambiguous. It's not allowed to come in when it's unambiguous. But she filed an affidavit saying my intent was and Sadiq and Brown go heavily into the intent and the purpose of the contract. And they both write in, the, in, the, in their opinions that you don't just look at you know, a sentence here and a sentence there. You look at the whole contract and the purpose of the contract. And the purpose of this contract was that she said to Mason Dixon, you know, go, go and get the benefits from the insurance company for work that's to be provided or, or not to be provided, or to be rendered or 
or to be provided or rendered, to be rendered or rendered. Um, and in both Sadiq and Brown, there were no services provided whatsoever to the homeowner, and the holding of those cases allowed the plaintiff to sue the insurance company. That's all we're at at the point here. The court's ruling on summary judgment said you have no right to, insure, to sue the insurance company, and our argument on that was threefold to, to defeat summary judgment. One was this agreement is not what she intended it to be, and she still has rights. The second point was we didn't get to finish our summary judgment um, preparation by taking these two depositions. The third part is is the consider is the that the public that the insurance company may have been acting as a public adjuster. And I'm going to rely on my briefs for that for that argument with only one caveat and one point to make on it. And that is again I go back to the second point, which is we weren't permitted to conclude our summary judgment um, discovery and take the depositions of Mason Dixon and Tower Hill to flesh that out, okay? Um, and um, I know there's a case that talks about a contractor not acting as a public adjuster, but in our case, we didn't get that far. We didn't get to the summary judgment issue if or we, uh, discovery. If we were to find uh, that the court should have taken evidence, what, what does that look like? Is that a mini trial on the issues you're it, speaking? It's, it's not a taking, it's, it, it's, not, it's not, not taking evidence so much as the ability of my client. Well, first of all, let me give you an example, okay? It is unrefuted that my client revoked this contract. The only evidence before the court is her statement in her, in her affidavit that I revoked this contract. Now, on summary judgment, as we know, even with the new rule standard, inferences are not completely disregarded. Inferences still play an important part of summary judgment analysis. There is no contrary evidence from Mason Dixon or from Tower Hill to say that that rev revocation was objected to by anyone. And in the law in the, in the law of revocation of assignments, it has to be a, a mutual revocation. Well, what I have in this, in my record, is I have a statement in my client's affidavit that says I revoked this agreement because she got nothing, no consideration. Nothing was done, nothing was performed for her by Mason Dixon and nothing was, she got no benefit out of this contract. So as a result, on summary judgment analysis, de novo review, again, all inferences viewed in the light most favorable to my client, notwithstanding the, the shifted burden standard of the new summary judgment rule, the inference is that they didn't object to the revocation. An objection to a revocation is, in my mind, tantamount to a mutual revocation because nobody can forward and say, no, wait a second, this contract is still valid and this contract is still enforceable on behalf of Mason Dixon. And so, but my client didn't get an opportunity to get there. So it, it's the, the arguments about the summary judgment evidence um, hang as a cloud over all of this, but it's not all that we're pinning our argument on. We're pinning our argument um, primarily, okay, if the, court agree, if the court agrees with us, it doesn't need to get to the summary judgment. It can say based on Sadiq and based upon Brown, this agreement um, read in its totality and in this record allows my client to sue the insurance company as she has a right to do under her policy. She didn't assign that away. And if that's what the court finds, then there is no, the argument about her inability to conclude her summary judgment evidence or discovery prior to the hearing falls by the way said, as does the public adjuster. But secondarily, if the court says, well, you know, we don't have to address the issue about whether or not this agreement is ambiguous or unambiguous because denying the plaintiff the right to take the deposition of the insurance company representative and the representative of Mason Dixon to explore whatever topics of discovery would be appropriate for discovery were in the opposition to summary judgment because one of the parties filed an affidavit and that person wanted, wanted to depose that person, the insurance company, then the court would reverse, obviously, vacate the summary judgment and say, move forward. Now, if the insurance company wanted to move for summary judgment again, the court pushes down the road the issue about whether or not this agreement is ambiguous or not, but at least we have left fully fleshed out. Obviously, from our position, we would like the court to do what the courts in Sadiq and Brown did, which is reverse and find that the um, that the summary judge that the assignment of benefits was unambiguous in terms of the fact that they required performance under the agreement, and since there was no performance, the records unrefuted that there was any performance done by Mason Dixon. This agreement is no longer enforceable. 
Um, Council, I think you're well into your rebuttal time, so and, it's your time. No, and, and I appreciate that. I, I was I was thinking that was like the other, where there's a five, 15 minutes as opposed to the 20. Yeah, kind I'm of not sure how many minutes there are, but 218. That's fine. I, I'd like to reserve the remainder of my time for rebuttal. Thank you. My name is Ryan Jones, and I represent Tower Hill. Uh, Your Honors, I'm going to start with a basic principle of all that's well settled. Once an insured assigns her benefits to a claim, she can no longer sue to enforce those benefits. And the reason for that is the principle that only one person or entity can own a claim at a time. So the question that's going to control this case is what benefits were assigned by the adopter. And to answer that question, we look to the express terms of the contract itself. Which look, appears, let, let, and let's look at those express terms, Council. Uh, how is this contract, this agreement, not ambiguous? Uh, I, I, as I, I mentioned to Council for the appellant, uh, serially there is mentioned to services rendered or to be rendered, immediately after rendered, uh, thereafter services rendered or to be rendered, and then after that, rendered. I mean, doesn't that create a facial ambiguity uh, for this assignment? It, it does not, Your Honor. And, and Your Honor is referring to the assignment of benefits paragraph. There's Correct. essentially four sentences in there. Well, and, and actually a, a predecessor uh, paragraph as well, Mr. Jones, uh, direct payment authorization says for services rendered by Mason Dixon Contracting. And then you're right, under the assignment of insurance benefits, it says rendered or to be rendered, rendered, rendered or to be rendered. How, how is that not a facial ambiguity because we have to look to the contract as a whole that's what uh nikon and Citic tell us and when we look to a contract as a whole we can tell what each sentence the purpose we can tell what the purpose of each sentence is so for which, example so which, so which is it uh, services rendered or to be rendered it is rendered and to be rendered the first sentence but it says or excuse me i misspoke or services rendered or to be rendered the first sentence describes the assignment that tells us what was assigned it is all benefits for services rendered or to be rendered. Well, what do you do with the direct payment authorization that says proceeds for services rendered? That is an instruction on how payment should be made. Does that specific sentence deals with how payment should be made because it tells the insurance company to pay Mason Dixon contracting directly for the services rendered. Okay, let's go back to the assignment of insurance benefits. You, you would agree that the second sentence says services rendered. It says services rendered, Judge, but we have to look at the entirety of that sentence because the last clause in that sentence describes its purpose. And the last clause in that sentence says, in this regard, I waive my privacy rights. What that tells us is that the insured has allowed Mason Dixon Contracting and the insurance company to freely discuss the services rendered. And the reason for that, when you think about the context of insurance claim, makes sense. That means Mason Dixon Contracting and Tower Hill Insurance can talk freely about the services that were performed, but it doesn't reference services to be rendered. And there's a good reason for that, because the insured has the option to actually repair the property or to pocket the money and keep the actual cash value. And that's something that she does not waive her privacy rights about. She can also take the money that was paid and decide to do other work on the home. She can upgrade certain areas and leave other areas unrepaired or change the plan altogether. That's completely her prerogative. And she does not want her privacy rights in that regard waived. So that's the purpose of that second sentence. When we move on to the third sentence, that talks about consideration. That's the statement of consideration. I make this assignment in consideration of services. How do you then reconcile Sadiq, which had deceptively similar language, and they said unequivocally it meant services rendered as opposed to services rendered or to be rendered. Well, Sadiq actually, it was, the distinction was a little bit different because Sadiq dealt with whether it was services rendered or to be rendered by this entity or all benefits that could possibly exist out of the claim. And what the court held is that it was services rendered or to be rendered by this entity, not everything else that's out there. And that would be the same interpretation that we could apply in this case. The services rendered or to be rendered by Mason Dixon Contracting. 
And if we want to know what those are, we look down the contract a little bit further where it says Mason Dixon will perform the following emergency services, mold remediation, and construction services. Those are the services that were assigned away by this assignment. What about the title roofing? That is that is one word at the top with no description to it, and that's why Nikon and Citic are so important, because we have to read the entirety of the contract. That word roofing is not followed by any statement to the effect of this is a roofing contract, or the only services to be performed are roofing. Couldn't emergency services, mold remediation, construction services be uh, related to roofing? Absolutely they could. Absolutely they could be related to roofing, but not necessarily limited to roofing. And that's why the entirety of the contract has to be read. But, but the, I mean, the first word is roofing. You'd agree with it. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the leading to all of this and everything below it uh, is below roofing. Absolutely, Your Honor, and, and quite frankly, with a hurricane claim, that makes sense because typically the roof is damaged, the water trickles in from there, and everything follows from that. The emergency services, the mold remediation, the interior repairs, all of that has its genesis typically from the roof. I, 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 what I'm having trouble with, and I, I, I want to think this through with you because uh, we want to make sure we get it right, but how do you, how do you spec all over that? And I, pardon my construction term, but how, how, how do you spec all over roofing when that, that's the lead-in term into all this? I mean, it's, it's the door that leads us into the contract. So why is that not enough in and of itself to create an ambiguity? Because the word roofing has no context to go with it. If, if the term roofing was followed by roofing is the sole subject of this contract, we'd be having a different conversation. But that's not what it says. It has roofing in the title, and perhaps this is their roofing form contract. But what we have to look at is all of the text, and that's what Nikon and Citic and all of the other cases tell us, to read the entirety of the assignment as a whole so that we can understand everything. And when we read all of that, it is much more clear than just a single word of what is to be performed. The services rendered or to be rendered are actually described and that's what I was talking about with the check marks, with the uh, emergency services, the mold remediation, the construction services. Those are the services that we look at. And the question becomes, is there anything else out there? Those are the benefits that are assigned. So the controlling question is, what else is appellant left with besides emergency services, mold remediation, and construction services? And the answer is nothing. And the reason the answer is nothing is because she did not present any evidence at the summary judgment hearing about what she was looking for other than what was assigned. That's where appellant failed to meet her burden of proof, and that's why the trial judge made the correct decision. If she had presented evidence in her affidavit that said, I'm making a claim for contents that were damaged, we could have a very different conversation. But she did not do that. Is uh, our analysis point an interpretation which is um, against the drafter of this agreement, or are we to interpret this agreement against the drafter, i.e. Mason Dixon? We only get there, Judge, if we find an ambiguity. But all of the case law that are cited in both of the briefs have found these assignments unambiguous when you look at the entire context. Nikon was unambiguous, Citic was unambiguous, and I'd submit this this contract, which Your Honor suggested is very, very similar in terms, is also unambiguous. So we don't have to look at construing against the draft. I, 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 I'm just one judge, uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Jones. Uh, but I, I'm just having trouble reconciling these four sentences uh, in this agreement where we keep seeing uh, services rendered or to be rendered. I, I'm, I'm just having difficulty if um, you just look at it reasonably how those can work together um, in, in the common whole. Right? And here's how they work together, Your Honor. The first sentence, as we discussed, is the statement of assignment. That says what was assigned, services rendered or to be rendered. The second sentence is a statement expressing intent to waive privacy rights with respect to services rendered. Those are two independent concepts that are totally consistent. The third sentence is a statement of consideration. I make this assignment in consideration for Mason Dixon's promise to perform services and service and to perform services. That's the statement of consideration. Again, totally consistent with the other uh, preceding two sentences. And then the final sentence, again, references the scope of what uh, is being directed to pay for services rendered or to be rendered. Again, consistent with all of the preceding sentences. 
And when we look at them as a whole, all of them together, it is a consistent concept that the intent of this document is to assign rights for services or services rendered. And that's what was assigned away. And it's again described down below, which we've talked about before. Well, I don't have any problem with that interpretation. What bothers me is I think you let in your argument by saying, hey, you can assign your benefits and it can go to Mason Dixon or it can go to other companies. It could be three or four or five companies that are policy owner can assign the benefits for protective services. It seems to me that the language ought to be pretty darn clear and unequivocal if I, the insurer, say I'm giving up all my entire rights to this policy to this one company that's going to do all the work to remediate my home in every respect. And I don't see that here. I, when I read this, just as me just reading, I go right to the language. It seemed to be Mrs. Excelia was just basically assigning the rights for the services to be provided by this company. And that's the long and short of it. She wasn't saying, I'm giving away the whole farm <laughs> rights. I'm giving away this one aspect. And I would agree with that 100%, Your Honor. The, the, the description of the services is there in the terms emergency services, mold remediation, and construction services. That's what she gave away. That doesn't say that she gave away everything. And Your Honor is absolutely right. Because the case law, the Nikon, and the Cidic, and the other cases say, if you reference services rendered or to be rendered as what is being assigned, that's not everything. That's not the entirety of the claim. And that's why I said the controlling question is what's left? What else does appellant have that she wants to sue Tower Hill for? And the answer, well, not, well, not, well, ahead, the answer is the, the answer is that she didn't offer any evidence of that. She didn't she didn't suggest that it was for contents. She didn't suggest that it was for But, but how how could she if it was unambiguous? I mean that's prohibited. Uh, I mean you, you've said it's not that we're bound by this agreement. So how could she put on any evidence? That evidence, Your Honor, wouldn't be interpreting the contract because the position at trial was... Well, no, wait, it was a summary judgment here. It was not a trial. Excuse me, at, at the trial level. The position at the trial level was Tower Hill taking the position, appellate has assigned away the rights to three, these three categories. And she has told me in this lawsuit nothing else about what she's seeking. So if she's seeking any of these three categories, she's barred because she doesn't have standing. In spite of being wife. in uh, roofing on the top of it. In, in spite of that, Judge, because when you read the whole thing, those three categories are described clearly in there. Wasn't there some evidence that she wanted to revoke? There was, there was Judge. Because, I mean, what, if I assign all, all my rights to these three categories of repairs to some company, then I said, well, I really don't want them to be given with the roof. I found a better roofer, so I revoke the assignment for the roofing. So I want to get another roof. Why, why can't she do that? Why did that become a fact issue? A revocation in an assignment is just like a revocation in a contract. It's got to be mutual. And, and that's what, from, from this court, the Hartford versus O'Connor case tells us. If she can't take back the assignment, right? Not unilaterally. It has to be mutual where both parties agree to it. And that's, again, where a pound failed on her burden of proof. She submitted an affidavit saying that I intend to revoke it, but she did not say anything about Mason Dixon contracting, agreeing to revoke it, or also did Mason Dixon ever respond to her her revocation? There's nothing in the record that specifically says about revocation, but when when we talk about reasonable inferences, like counsel mentioned, Mason Dixon was present at the hearing, arguing against Appellant's position, and Mason Dixon was actually embroiled in a lawsuit with Tower Hill, enforcing the rights to which it was assigned. I think the reasonable implication there is that Mason Dixon did not agree to revoke it. Help me again, Mr. Jones, because I, I frankly don't understand. What would you have had her do? And you, you claim this agreement is unambiguous, correct? Correct. Yeah, that's your position? Yes, sir. So what could she offer that was going to change that? As far as the ambiguity of the contract? Yes. Nothing. We don't need to get past that. The, so, the so what's your point in that she failed at something below? Because she assigned three categories of rights within that assignment. That assignment is unambiguous and she's assigned those rights away. Now, if she has standing left to sue Tower Hill, she has to show that it's something other than those three categories of rights because they have been assigned away to Mason Dixon. Mason Dixon now owns them and is currently suing Tower well, Hill. Well, you just told us it's unambiguous, so she still has any rights outside of those three, correct? If she does have rights, she needs to explain what they are. And that's, and that's where the evidence failed. Because, and I gave earlier the example of contents. Co contents are couches, clothes, you know, fixtures, furnishings, any of those things. 
Yeah. But the, the motion for summary was on this assignment. How, how would it, so you're saying at the summary judgment hearing on this assignment, she had to present evidence of other things that were not covered by, according to you, this unambiguous agreement? Correct. And, and, here's, and here's that explanation. I apologize if I'm not making myself clear. The assignment is essentially Tower Hill's defense to Salyer's case. Salyer sued Tower Hill and said, you have breached the insurance policy, you owe me more money. Tower Hill's defense was, ma'am, you don't have standing because you have assigned your rights away according to this contract. The rebuttal to that could have been, yes, I did assign away those rights, but I have other rights. I did not assign away the entirety of the claim. I still have the right to correct for contents, for example, or spoiled foods, or anything else under the policy. But she did not do that. So the only rights that were at issue are the ones that she assigned away in the assignment of benefits. And once she assigned them away, she can no longer pursue her claim because she doesn't own them. So that took her standing away. That's why summary judgment was appropriate. Didn't she, she did that by stating she was only uh, seeking services for roofing? Uh, I'm sorry, Your Honor. She, she, I mean, didn't she reserve other rights by stating that she, I mean, she put her affidavit, correct, that this was solely for roofing? And her argument, her argument was not to throw out contents or spoiled foods or any of the other examples I, I threw out there. Her argument was to say, I only intended to sign away my right to roofing. These other categories of emergency services and mold remediation, I, she believes she still owns them. But that's not what the contract says. And we can't look beyond the face of the contract unless it's ambiguous. So well, it's her affidavit. Well, it seems to me that the contract is going to assign away every right that she has it needs to be as I said earlier, clear and unambiguous. Everyone would understand it to be that way. And what I'm hearing you say is, well, no, this was this is adequate enough. What we the assignment clause here is adequate enough to, on uh, motion for summary judgment, conclude as a matter of law that she intended to give away everything. It was adequate to show that she intended to give away everything with respect to those three categories. It was not adequate enough to say, I give away everything in the entire world. Well, that, that's okay. Well, I, I think to me that decides the case. I think that, that the trial judge was wrong to basically say that she has no standing to pursue him against the company because if she does come up with something, let's say four years out, I don't know what your statute of limitations is, but what the policy is. Five, but <laughs> okay, we're we'll coming on five, but we're moving past it. She finds some issue for the first time and makes a claim. Well, she had, I think what you said is, well, this wouldn't cover that. This, this assignment clause wouldn't cover that necessarily. It's not, if it was in those four three or four categories, yes. But if it was something else, no. And Judge, that's why summary judgment was correct. Because Tower Hill's position is you've assigned away the rights in these three categories. You cannot sue me for those. Her position in response was to say, I'm not talking about those. I'm just talking about roofing. That's all I signed away. She never mentioned any of the other categories. If she wanted to mention another category or bring it up, the time to do it was in opposition to summary judgment. Well, why is that? I, I don't. That's the part I don't understand, counsel. I mean, where in the rule does it say that? That I mean, you're you're there to defend yourself against a motion for summary judgment. And I understand the rules changed, and we can talk about the the verbiage of the rule. But uh, uh, beyond the moving party's motion, I, I just don't see that she has an obligation to bring other claims at that time on the motion for summary judgment. The, the motion for summary judgment, the argument that was made was that there was no standing. And there was no standing because the, the rights were assigned away. These three categories. That meets Tower Hill's burden on summary judgment. As to those three categories. As to those three categories. If she wanted to show something else was out there, that's where her burden arises. Where's that in the rule? I, I, and so somehow she has an independent uh, obligation to bring up a new claim on summary judgment? to show that there's something else out there. But she may not even know about it at that point. Yeah, yeah. Well, she didn't know about it at that time. We may have a different issue with a three-year reporting requirement. But, but the bottom line is we were over a year into litigation. And if there was something else to be brought forth in that lawsuit, that was the time to do it. Because Tower Hill's description, the argument was these three categories encompass everything that we know about. Because Tower Hill didn't know about any other damages out there. The only three categories were brought to them by Mason Dixon through that estimate that Council mentioned. Here, here's Mason what, here's what troubles me. I'm, I'm, from the 30,000 from level looking down, you have a homeowner who's paid for this policy, who's been hit by this hurricane, has damage. Damage estimated to be about $600,000 by Mason Dixon. Mm -hmm. 
the insurer comes in, cuts a check for eighty nine thousand, sends that to Mason Dixon. Basically, what one sixth of what the company estimates is the cost. I assume that check is still sitting in the bank account, of Mason Dixon, or is out there, if not in the pocket of the homeowner, right? So, so, there's there's no, so, so she's had nothing done on her property pursuant to the contract of insurance. I don't know. I meant to ask me there. Well, I mean, is there a claim against Mason Dixon to get that money back? So we should have eighty nine thousand dollars so that she can do some repairs. But uh, what I'm troubled by is that <laughs> it seems like this uh, the legal arguments about this assignment of insurance benefits becomes this uh, kind of Orwellian life for the for the property owner. Like I, I don't. Damage, not that I just said, I'm in this legal battle, and my house is still damaged. Your Honor, I see my time expired. I'd be happy to answer questions. The answer is that the, the right that the homeowner has is now against the contractor, just like any other construction contract that a homeowner has with a contractor where the homeowner has paid the contractor and the contractor is not performing. That's essentially what happened because instead of sending the check to the homeowner to go to the contractor, the assignment instructed Tower Hill to send the check directly to the contractor. So it's been paid for work that it didn't perform, and that's where the remedy lies. All right, thank you. Thank you. Judge Baker, I'm going to give you a really precise answer to the question you just asked about what's the status of it the answer is i don't believe the record demonstrates that a claim has been made one way or the other by my client against mason dixon there as the court knows the record shows there's a separate lawsuit that mason dixon is prosecuting against the insurance company that's still going forward but i don't believe that in this record there's any evidence or any information as to whether or not she's made it and i don't believe that she has I can't. Whether she made a claim against them or whether there's a, you said there's a claim pending. A, it's a claim brought by Mason Dixon against Tower Hill. I'll give you one minute of time. So Marshall wants to go. It, it's a claim brought by Mason Dixon against Tower Hill, and that lawsuit is still pending in the circuit court. I don't believe that there's a, a cross claim or a third party claim or an independent claim in which my client has, has sued Tower Hill. It's not clearly not in, in this record. Um, well, please don't use up your time on that. Forget no, and, and, and I, I just wanted to answer your, your question. Um, and when we get to quite, but when we get to answering a question like that or an argument that's been made by counsel for the insurance company, then we are going far afield of summary judgment. We're discussing things that are outside of the record, and so that consideration, of that argument made by them doesn't support, stand as a basis to support summary judgment, where on de novo review, we look at what's before us. And what we have before us is an argument. What do you say to the argument uh, that we had a colloquy about, counsel, uh, that somehow your client had an obligation to talk about additional things that she was uh, purposing to advance against Tower Hill? I, I don't know what supports that, what the legal support for that argument is. It's not based on case law. It's not based upon a rule. What the summary judgment rule requires is that you put forth evidence in opposition, assuming that the defense has made a, an argument that would not that the opposing party would not be able to survive a directed verdict on the new standard. Um, but my client's affidavit does that. She says very clearly, it was my intent that this was a roofing contract only, and that's what I was assigning to Tower Hill. Tower Hill, as the record we know, submits a claim for five hundred seventy-nine thousand dollars. Now. I don't believe her roof is a five hundred seventy-nine thousand dollars roof. Okay, and having just replaced the roof on my house, I know that that's not what a roof repair costs. Um, so we are we have a situation where she did put forth evidence, notwithstanding that she wasn't required to manufacture claims. The issue is whether or not she retained interest in this insurance policy to bring a claim against the insurance company, and and whether the court finds this agreement ambiguous totally, in which case. She has complete standing to proceed forward, or the court finds that there is a conflict or there's issues of fact, unresolved issues of material fact on the interpretation of the agreement as it relates to the claim being defended by the insurance company, then in either scenario, she still has standing, standing to pursue her claim. And so we would ask that the court, if it, if it deems appropriate under Sadiq and Brown, to reverse 
and <coughs> the judgment in favor of my client saying find that this contract is ambiguous as written because it's not like the city can round and um, or reverse because there are unresolved issues of material fact as it relates to how to interpret this agreement based upon her unrefuted evidence thank you well thank you council thank you both for excellent arguments uh, what we'll do now is uh, open it up to the students here uh, to ask questions